Happy Palm Sunday, church. So good to see you out. I tell you what, this is, this is Passion Week. This is the start of what most people refer to as Holy Week, and it is one of my favorite times of the year. And you remember last week, we began kind of a, a series on passion, and I asked you a question. What are you passionate about? And it was kind of a, a, a probing question, you know, maybe I should ask your kids or your spouse, you know, what, what would they say you are passionate about? And we looked at several passion killers that kind of keep against our spiritual fervor, keep that zeal alive that Paul was talking about. And if you were here two weeks ago, we focused on spiritual revival and repentance. And God led us to that beautiful passage in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, where we talked about the need for God's recipe to be followed, where God says, if you do four things, I will do three. You remember he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray, will seek my face, and here's the good part, turn from their wicked ways. There's the repentance factor. If you will do that, if you do those four things, God said, I will do these three. I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive your sin, and I will heal their land. And that sets the stage for today. It brings us to Matthew chapter 21. Another well-known passage, and I think we're all at least somewhat familiar with it. Maybe if you're new to the faith, you, you might not have heard this story in its full glory. But this is called the triumphal entry. There's a reason why it's called Palm Sunday. People wave these palm branches and their shouts of Hosanna, and they're waving and they're, they're laying down their coats in the street, and the crowds are adoring uh, for now. <laughs> oh, what a few days can do. But at this moment, the crowds are going crazy. In Matthew 21, we pick up the story in verse 7. Read with me. It says, So the disciples brought the donkey to him and the colt. They laid their clothes on them, and they sat Jesus on that. And a very great multitude. Notice it's not just a multitude. It's not a great multitude. It is a very great. This was huge. This was the parade of all praise. The great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed him cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now these are loaded words. There is so much gold here that we can unpack. This is a big deal. This is a parade event. We've got a, a picture here that kind of the artist described kind of what it, what it may look like. This doesn't do it justice. It was so much more... Uh, uh, effusive, and the crowds were, were adoring, and they were singing Hosanna, they were shouting, save us. And then they did something really strange. What is up with those palm branches? Did you ever wonder about that? I've never really dug deep into it till this week. I said, you know, I'm going to look into this. How exactly did everyone even seem to know to do this? Was there a signal? Was there a cue? What's the point of the palm branches at, at, this, at this moment you know, I mean, I wonder, like, what was, was it a request from Jesus? Was there, were they putting him on the donkey? And he's like, hey, guys, before we go into town, I just want to, you know what would make this really special to me? <laughs> if you all would go and just, why don't you cut down some palm branches? And I want you to lay them in front of the donkey. And better yet, take off your clothes and lay them down, too. And I'm going to let my donkey ride on that. What, what was the point of this? And then if you look earlier, about 200 years prior to this, you look at the Maccabees, and there was a Maccabean revolt where something similar happened. See, they would cut down the palm branches because it represented independence, even back then. So palm branches had a long history with the Jewish people of representing, this was, I'm just going to lay it out, this was a political statement as well as a religious statement. See, when they saw and felt the oppression of Rome, the Jewish people would wave palm branches to each other. Like, <laughs> we can't wait for another to take his place. Oh, let's get rid of this Caesar. Let's get rid of this leader. Let's get rid of these wascally women who are oppressing us. I can't wait to be free from the oppression that is coming down. We cannot wait to have these chains broken. And they knew their history. In fact, did you know, if you go back and look at coins in this day, there's palm branches on the Jewish coins. They knew their history. This was hearkening back. This wasn't a spontaneous thing like, hey, let's do, oh, what do we got a lot of? Palm branches. This was a, oh, you know who this is. You know who this is coming? This is the Messiah. 
This is the one who's going to break the yoke that we've had on our shoulders from Rome. This is the one who's going to come. We're just going to be the mighty nation. We're going to come back. Woo, woo, the Jews are back. And, right, and of course, you know, he absolutely did set them free. He just didn't do it in the way they were expecting. And within a matter of days, they went from way up here to way down here. Oh, how fickle man's heart can be. And we usually dive into that. The last few years, that's kind of what we do on Palm Sunday. But today, I felt led to go a different direction. I want to, do, so I want to focus on the other half of this famous story. The story that, that gets lost is what happened after the loud, triumphant entry and before the crucifixion. Because something else happened. Something that was so profound that continues our theme of passion today. And it is a powerful story that speaks to something we wrestle with. And I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way, but you're going to see what Jesus does addresses all of our common human desires for self-rule. He addresses all of our desire to steer our own ship, to have our way. This is natural. We don't have to like, fight for this. This is what we instinctively want to do. I read a great, uh, a great paragraph here. Uh, one of my favorite writers, Dr. Davis, said this. He says, Within us all, there is an urge, an internal drive to hold the reins of our life tightly in our own hands, to chart our own course, to determine our own destiny. But, here's the tension, intertwined with this desire is the profound truth that challenges our deepest instincts, and that is surrender. The call to surrender. Wow, man, that is so, so deep. The funny thing about that word surrender even when it deals with God, is it's counterintuitive. We don't really like the word surrender because it always seems to imply we've lost. We flew the white flag, right? Like, well, sorry, we tried. I guess we'll surrender. And so there's this beautiful tension that we face between maintaining control and letting go and trusting someone else. Is there anyone else that's worthy to trust with the direction of our life? That's the struggle that Jesus was facing. Remember, fully God, but fully human. And he gives us the beautiful, divine example, showing us a path of true surrender. Toward the end of Passion Week, if you're unfamiliar with the story, he leaves the upper room, we've already done the Lord's Supper, and they go to this garden, beautiful garden, still there, called the Garden of Gethsemane. And he goes and he says, guys, I need you to pray with me. And they kneel and they pray. And then something happens with those disciples. And he goes a little further and he prays again, and it is anguish. Artists have tried for years to, to, to capture this, the anguish, the agony of what he knew was coming. Can you picture the scene? It's eerily quiet, maybe a few flickering torches, maybe a few birds in the area, and that's it. And Jesus goes, and in the eerie, serene garden of Gethsemane, some of his closest companions are nearby, but now they've fallen asleep and they've left him all alone in his anguish. Yet Jesus is absolutely fully aware of the agony of the cross that awaits him. Nothing escapes his knowledge. He knows what's ahead. He kneels in prayer and he prays this. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared with him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's a condition we know today as hematria. The anguish, the weight of the sin of mankind that he knew was coming. The horror of the cross. Remember, this was a public execution technique they have used now for a long, great, great drops of blood. So here in the quiet of this garden, we see this ultimate act of surrender. Jesus, the Son of God himself, faced with the weight of the world's sin, the horror of the cross, has a choice. His will or the Father's will. And he submits to the Father's will. Guys, this wasn't like, <sighs> like an emo teenager resignation, like, okay, I'll do it. <clears throat> this was a divine choice. This was the ultimate submission. This was active trust to submit to the Father's plan. And it is beautiful. And he uses the word surrender. 
What a profound example for us. His willing to surrender to the Father, even to the point of death on a cross. Remember, he's innocent. He hasn't done anything wrong. Yet he's willing to do this, and he invites us to go into this deeper relationship with God. So in the quiet of the garden, we witness this act, this act of surrender. And I, I want to focus on that word, because when you hear the word surrender, like me, it's loaded with connotations today. Maybe you're old enough to, to think of uh, World War II and Winston Churchill, when you hear those great words where he's trying to encourage people's resolve, and he says, we will fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. That's the best I got for Winston Churchill. It's not too bad, right? It's better than my usual British accent. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're dismissed. So I think of this, right? We'll never surrender. He bolstered nations that were teetering under the weight of Nazi Germany and things were not going good. He made these great things. Or maybe you are a Wolfpack fan and you have other ideas of what it means to persist. You say, don't give up. Don't ever give up. That's my best Jimmy V. And you think, oh, indeed they have not given up. I'm not going to get political here and pick a side. Because my team ain't even in it. So, Or maybe you had the privilege of growing up in the glorious 80s when music was good. And you remember hearing things like Corey Hart's Never Surrender. And if you're not familiar with him, he also had, I wear my sunglasses at night. So I was going to play it, but couldn't learn it in time. I think of this, and I'm going somewhere spiritual with this. When he sings his lesser hit, Never Surrender, he's encouraging you, don't give up. Never surrender. Don't back down. You are the master of your fate. You flex. You bow up. You are the one. You just grit and bear it, and you've got this, right? But that flies in the face of what we just read with Jesus. And I look at these things and I'm thinking, how do I reconcile it? Because these well-known slogans, we've heard them, we've seen them, we even sing these things, and it seems to fly in the face because here in the garden, we learn that it's actually in surrender that we find true freedom. Not by asserting our will, but by aligning it with God's. So on this Palm Sunday, I'm going to leave you with three things in the beauty of surrender. I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is that we have a call to surrender. If you claim to be a disciple of Christ, we have to surrender our will. We have to echo Jesus' prayer. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He lays out the path to discipleship. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He tells it like it is. In fact, a few earlier chapters there in Luke, he gives a formula for surrender that would turn the world on its head. Look with me. He says this in Luke 9. He says, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself Take up the cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will say, what in the world is this about? Talk about, this is a paradox wrapped in an enigma surrounded by mystery. This is so bizarre. It's so hippity-flippity upside down from what we think today. And he's like, what do you mean like lose my life and then I'll find it? What is this obsession with, with taking up Cross, guys, we have to remember, take up your cross daily. This was, this was like absolutely radical back then. To say, this was an instrument of death. The cross, never forget, this shape right here that I preach behind, when people saw it, they thought capital punishment. They would be horrified to look at us today and think we are gold plating this and wearing it around our neck and we're singing songs about it. This would be the equivalent, if we were back in first century, of them coming today and seeing us gold-plating electric chairs and singing songs about electrocution. I want you to think about that. We sing songs about the cross. We don't bat an eye. Don't lose the graphic nature of this. When we look at this, we think, oh, that's kind of shocking. Oh, sorry, bad pun, <laughs> right? But this is what we lose in translation. The cross was an instrument of torture. So when Jesus says, take up your cross daily, he is literally not sugarcoating anything and saying, die daily. So you know I got to ask, how you doing with that? Dying daily. We have to keep this in context, guys. What Jesus was saying was so radical, and that's the life he's called us to. It's not a life of ease. It's not a life of just kind of, you know, being marginally committed to the cause. 
the apparent paradox isn't really a paradox when you dig into it because when we surrender our lives to Christ by losing our lives for his sake, that is when we find true life. When we give up control, when we hand the reins over to the Holy Spirit, that is when we find true freedom. And as we learned last week, right, this isn't a one-time deal. We talked about this. You know, Jesus says, I choose your way over mine. And Paul said this. He says, I need you to never be lacking in your zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. We have to fight for this to serve. This is not our default. So how do you respond to his call to surrender? Let's just go there a little early. I won't wait for the challenge. Is there any area where you feel you might be holding on a little too tightly to the reins of your life? Is there any area that you're holding on too tightly maybe to your own plans or seeking your own comfort or maybe just building your own little kingdom of security? It's so easy. Are we willing to let go, to trust him, to truly believe that in surrendering to him, we actually will find the life that we've always longed for? what we actually wanted, I want to urge you, take Jesus at his word. Believe that he knows what's best. And it's going to fly in the face of what your family may think sometimes, or what your education may have taught you, or what popular culture or social media says. Make no mistake, following Jesus is not popular. We're not here to please man. We're here to please the Son of God. We follow with him. It is dying to ourselves that we find our true life in Christ. Maybe we need to start beginning every day with a serious heartfelt prayer saying, God, I need you to give me the strength and the courage and the faith today to follow you as a true disciple. To not be the ones that kneel and fall asleep at the garden, but to go all the way with you to the cross. Where we trust him deeply, where we find that abundant life that he promises. I came to give you life and give it more abundantly to the full It's in surrendering our will to God's that we find the freedom that we're looking for. The next aspect I think we need to be aware of is the cost of surrender. This is where it gets a little awkward. I found the most awesome illustration to talk about the the surrendering of the lordship of Christ. And I've got two little aides here from Little Mercy. Let me borrow her, her little piggy and her chicken. (laughs) <laughs> I know it's not a chicken, but this is the closest I've got, right? And in this illustration, the piggy and the chicken are going to market, and they get there, and they see a sign on the front of the supermarket that says, we have a problem. Eggs and bacon are desperately needed. To which the chicken doesn't bat an eye and looks at the piggy and says, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll donate the eggs if you donate the bacon. And the piggy looks and says, in horror, absolutely not. I will not. And the chicken still doesn't quite get it and says, why not? What is your problem? Are you not committed? And he says, "Uh, sir, chicken, for you, it's a contribution. For me, it's my life. And I think it is far easier for us to contribute an egg here and there to the cause of Christ than it is to give our life. We just read that verse. Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Well, that put... Chickens or girls? Did I know that? Okay, all right. I don't don't know. I didn't know there was between a cow and a... What was the other thing? A horse? Okay, all right, yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you about that another time. Matthew chapter 14 or in Mark chapter 14, he goes on and he captures an encounter, this, this whole scene, just a little bit deeper. His closest companions have fallen to the ground under the, uh, the weight of sleep, whatever, and now Jesus goes further and he, he gives a little bit more context. He says, going a little further, he fell to the ground and he prayed, if it were possible that this hour might pass from him. This is a little different than the cup. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. All right, pause there. Do you know what this means? Abba, Father. This is the closest we can translate to dearest dad or daddy. The connotation here is crawling up in your father's lap and curling up in safety. So when Jesus used these terms, this is not an accident. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Like, we both know you could prevent this. Remove this cup for me. Yet, 
it is. Yet, it's not about what I want, but what you will. Can you picture that? The silence in that garden. Here's Jesus embodying both his divine majesty, but yet human frailty. And he's grappling with the cost. He knows what's about to happen. Don't miss this. This powerful moment isn't just a nice historical footnote. This is the crux. He is showing the cost of genuine discipleship. He's showing what ultimate surrender looks like. In one breath, he says, remove this cup. That shows you the depth of his distress. And in the next breath, he says, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. This is the pinnacle, the mountaintop of commitment. And this is our example. So you know I got to ask, how are we doing with that? Gethsemane that night, his surrender, the agony, the absolute trust. This is the definitive model for our faith. This gives me hope. This means daily surrender is possible. I can wake up, take up my cross, and submit my ambitions, my dreams, my goals, and put on his yoke and say, you know what? I want to advance your will. So let me ask this. Where is God maybe calling you to a deeper surrender today? Don't just come in and take notes and be like, hey, that was, that was deep, that was profound. I hadn't thought upon something. Bring it home. How does this apply? Is there maybe an area where you need to release control of a situation that's been consuming your thoughts? You know exactly. If this is you, it's the one that you think about laying in bed at night. It's the one that keeps you up. It's that one that you have anguish over. It's the one that you wake up in the middle of the night or you wake up early and it's still got that pit stomach. What situation, maybe is it time that you relinquish control, that you submit, you say, you know what, God, I'm done. I'm not going to consume and stew and marinate on this when you said I can cast my cares and my anxieties on you. Maybe it's an area you need a surrender of forgiveness. Maybe somebody has wronged you and wronged you and hurt you deeply. And maybe they haven't even apologized. And it's got a hold of you. And you think about it. You didn't have to think far because maybe a face just ran through your head. Maybe you've got a picture or a name. You can't carry that. Maybe that's what you need to surrender today. Maybe it's stepping out in faith to embrace something that God's been calling you to do, pulling on your heart, and you've been resisting. Maybe it's a step of faith. Maybe it's into a calling of some sort, whether that's a ministry or, or some bold step or some horizon that you know is kind of there on the, uh, I, uh, I'm still scared, I should, I shouldn't, I should. What is it? What is it that God may be today calling you to a deeper surrender? And remember, surrender is not an act of defeat. It's a beautiful, it is a declaration of trust. We trust in his goodness. We trust that he is faithful and he is awesome. All right, now I want to say something here. As I was preparing this, I, I, want, I don't want to just go heavy on one side of this. I want to say clearly at least once, surrender, uh, it doesn't shield us from problems. Okay? When we surrender, it doesn't automatically pause all the storms in your life that are coming. Right? Surrender doesn't automatically qualify, doesn't guarantee that it's just going to be all ease and bliss because I'm following the Lord and tiptoe through the tulips and everything's great and we just have our umbrella and we're dancing in the rain, having a blast. I don't want to paint a false gospel. Look at the life of Jesus. What it does guarantee is that he is with us through the storms that will come in life. Does that make sense? It guarantee, surrender guarantees that his presence, his guidance will remain with us. It opens the door to this life and we're no longer governed by fear and we're no longer governed by self-rule. Ooh, that's a big one, especially here in America where we love things prosperous. We love to have things our way. As we look at Jesus' example in Gethsemane, my prayer is we would start inviting the Holy Spirit to illuminate areas in our life where we need to surrender more, a little more deeply. I want us to approach our Father with hearts willing to say, God, no longer is it about my will, but yours be done. Trusting that this act of surrender is where I'm going to discover my purpose. Remember, it is in losing our lives for his sake that we truly find them. Which brings us to our last point. Hopefully, we will all see the necessity 
of surrender. The necessity of this. In our journey of faith, as we go down this road, the concept of surrender really is not an option. But in American churches, we make it optional. This is a cornerstone. This is a tenet of our faith. It is non-negotiable. If you claim to be a disciple of Christ, we must follow Christ. And sometimes we don't count the cost. We don't understand that the necessity of surrender is not optional. I love what Paul says in his letter to the Philippians. Look what he says here, Philippians 2. He says, so have this mind among yourselves, which is yours, it's available, in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, didn't count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. But instead, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And just so you don't miss it, he says, not just any death, the most embarrassing, humiliating, grotesque death, the death on a cross. Jesus' surrender, as described here by Paul, was not a momentary decision that was made because it was just unavoidable circumstances. That is a revelation. It wasn't like, oh, okay, resignation. He makes the willing choice to do this. It was a lifestyle, and there it is. There is your truth grenade for the week. Surrender is a lifestyle. If you could take one thing with you today, surrender is a lifestyle, a continuous posture of humility and obedience. Ooh, two characteristics of Christ. How are you doing with those? When people look at you, when you leave this place, when you're fighting for your place in line at the Golden Corral feeding trough, do people see humility and obedience? When you're standing in line at the house of mouse, and there's all these people elbowing you out of the way, and you've been waiting, and that little fast pass thing's long gone, that wristband thing don't work, and it's just, whew. man, I'll be honest, I'm just being real. This is where the rubber beats the road. What is surrender as a lifestyle? It is a continuous posture daily of humility and obedience to the Father's will. Being willing to advance, liberation comes. Surrender in the kingdom of God is that God has for you. So how do we live this out? Well, when you wake up in the morning, you begin with a prayer. You say, God, I am going to submit my plan to you. I am going to surrender my rights. You can have them. I am going to be done with being in the driver's seat today. I'm going to let go of my control, any rights I think I have, because your plan is far better than anything I could devise on my own. There's an old joke out there that says, if you want to make God laugh, tell him all about your big plans. Did you know that's actually based on a Yiddish proverb that says, man plans, God laughs? It goes all the way back. To the early Jews. We plan, God laughs. Surrender is not a one-time activity. We learned that last week. It is a daily decision to say, not my will, but yours. This lifestyle of surrender, this is what has the power to transform your life from lukewarm to sold out for Christ. Surrender. That word right there. Because you know what that covers? It covers obedience. It covers humility. It covers repentance. It covers when we are submitted and surrender to the king and we say, your will be done. I want to wear your purpose. That changes everything. That deepens our relationship with the Father and it impacts the kingdom. I see I'm just about out of time, so here's what I'm going to do. I want to share with you a story that I hope will help illustrate the counting of the cost and remember his passion this week for us. I'm going to show you a picture and I think almost everybody knows the name of the person on the left. Who's this? Darth Vader. All right. But it's the guy on the right that I want to point out. Does anybody know his name? George Lucas. Not as many people know that. That's Happy George, the originator of Star Wars. What a lot of people don't realize about this man was he had a chance to count the cost and make a decision that would forever change his life. He had only made one movie before Star Wars, 
who was a modest hit on American Graffiti in the early 70s, something like that. And he goes to 20th Century Fox and he says, hey, I've got this great idea. It's a space opera. I've got a golden robot and a little trash can guy that goes around and we use a mystical force and we got these swords that aren't really swords or lights. And, you know, and he describes his field thing. He's so excited. He's like, what do you think? And they were like, oh, what? He didn't have any clout. And they said, no, no, you're going to love it. It's going to be great. It's going to be huge. And they're like, okay, big guy. And they said, I'll tell you what. We're going to green light this space opera. We're going to give you a minimal budget. And we're going to give you the average director's salary of $500,000 to go make this. That's your salary. You can have it. And you can go into your little desert in Tunisia and do your little sandy space opera and have your Jawas and all this stuff. And 20th Century Fox, they didn't have any hope for it. They just hoped to get their money back, maybe a modest return. And then George Lucas did something unthinkable in the industry. He goes back to the studio and he says, I'll tell you what, keep your salary. In fact, I won't take a penny. I will give you all 500000 Back then, mid-70s, that was a lot of money. I mean, that was a salary for him. He set him up. And he said, I want you to keep the whole thing. And he says, I, the only thing I ask is instead, will you just give me the rights to any sequels, if this does well, and any merchandise? <laughs> Y'all, 20th Century Fox snapped that agreement up so fast because they didn't count the cost. They laughed and said, deal. Give us back our 500000 you can have your little goofy rights to your weird space opera. Good luck. How do you think they felt when in 2012, George Lucas goes back to the studio and says, hey, I want to sell it back to you for $4 billion. <laughs> and it goes on to gross $20 billion because he looked ahead. He counted the cost. He knew what these lunch boxes were going to do and these action figures were going to do. And he knew about the lightsabers and the buns that you wear on your hair at Easter, or, I mean, Halloween, and they're walking around doing all these costumes, right? He saw all this. He looked at it. And then he knew 50 years later they're still making movies and putting this out on Disney+. Plus. See, 20th Century Fox, they didn't think about it. They didn't count the cost. They made a horrible deal by surrendering the rights to this film franchise. I'm going somewhere spiritual with this. I want you to think about this. As we look at this Passion Week, I want to encourage you to embrace surrender. Truly count the cost. What does it mean to follow Jesus this Passion Week? Don't let this go. Mom, Dad, talk to your kids. Don't let it be about some Easter bunny. Let it be about the resurrection and a man who came, put on skin, and died for us and took our sin. What does it mean to identify with him, with Christ, to follow? And I want us to pray, God, I want these lesser things, these distractions, all these things, take them away, let me focus on you and be a man after your heart. Your Palm Sunday challenge is this. I want you to pray about the cost of discipleship. And I want you to willingly surrender to God's will, to step into this journey, to surrender. Remember, it's not a one-time decision, guys. This is daily. Every day this week when you wake up, I want you to continually, verbally lay down our life and trust that his ways are higher and better and more fulfilling. Would you bow with me? I'm going to pray for you before we go. Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts open and spirits surrender to you. We acknowledge the cost of following Jesus demands our all. Total surrender. God, we choose this path willingly. We trust you. You are faithful. You are good. Your ways are so much higher than ours. Would you give us the courage to daily follow after you, to take up our cross, to die to ourselves. Help us to trust in you in your plan, believing you will lead us. God, I pray that you would fill each person in this room. Those listening online, I pray that you would rise up that your Holy Spirit would fan into flame our convictions as we live. We want you to use us for your glory. Let us be a tool in your hands. I pray that our surrender is a sweet sacrifice in your presence, a testimony to the transforming power of your love. We pray this prayer of surrender in Jesus' powerful name. Amen and amen. I've got a couple great updates I want to share with you, and then we're done. 
I've heard from a few people on the Ghana missions team, and they are having an incredible impact. It has been a long, long, powerful, busy week for them. Please pray. They fly home tomorrow. They begin their journey. The shoeboxes did arrive. They opened them this past Friday. They've got footage. I haven't seen any of it yet. So Pastor Bill is going to have the privilege of sharing that. We'll be able to see the pictures and any video they shot. I believe in two weeks is when they do their report and get to share all of the great things that God has done. So please pray for them for their safe return, that their health maintains. I can't wait to hear all the testimony of all God has done. Resurrection Sunday is next week. Please, please, please pray about who needs to hear the gospel message. This is the day that most people, if they're going to come, will come. This is the day that family member, that coworker, that school person is uh, kind of open. We've talked. I've invited this same person now three different times when I told you that I'm praying about. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what God's doing on his heart. Uh, he, he's hemming and hawing, and he, he may go with his uh, family to another church. That's great. If they go, so, just go somewhere, right? I want them to, to hear the gospel message. Who are you praying for? Guys, we have the best news ever. We can't keep it to ourselves. You've got to be willing to share that. Okay, this is part of our sacrifice. Also, don't forget, we have behind Priscilla a photo booth. I would love it if you guys would take some pictures. We can do them today afterwards. Take your time. Come early next week. Get your, all your fancy outfits and just tag Potter's hand. Let people know he is alive. Maybe tag it, he is risen, Easter at PH, something like that. That's something that we've been wanting to do the last few years. We've got a beautiful backdrop. I hope that you will partake in that. If you're traveling this spring break, please be safe. My family and I are going to hit the road in a matter of hours. Pray for us. We're going to try a camping thing during the spring break with the kids. But we found a dead mouse in the camper last night, and that has thrown a wrench in everything. So uh, let's stand together, and uh, you pray for me, and I will pray for you. And I hope I will be back this Sunday, and we will celebrate the resurrection together. Let's pray together. Father, as we go, I pray that you would go before us. Give us that divine appointment. Just open up the doors. Help us to be your tool. I pray that you would give us the words to say as we invite somebody to hear the greatest news ever. That's our prayer as we go. In Jesus' name, and all God's church said, amen and amen. God bless you guys. I love you.